scientists have recently accidentally discovered a whole new formula for pi and that's what we're going to talk about in today's video so let's dive straight into it. Firstly who discovered this new formula for pi? Saha and Sinha who work at the Centre for High Energy Physics at the Indian Institute of Science published a paper called Field Theory Experiments of String Theory Amplitudes and in this paper this is where they represent their new formula for pi. Now you might have expected the paper itself to mention pi in the title because this is the paper that discovers this whole new formula for pi, but interestingly the section that explains this new formula for pi is actually in the appendix. Both scientists were working on string theory amplitudes and it just so happens that while they were working on the research behind this, they accidentally discovered a whole new formula for pi. The equation that both Saha and Sinha discovered is this. So we have that pi equals 4 plus. Now when I made a very short video on this on my Instagram and YouTube and TikTok, a lot of people were like, but pi is 3.141 one and so on, why have we got a plus here? 4 plus something is going to be greater than pi and so what comes next, I want you to bear in mind that this can be negative because I know that confused a lot of people. So 4 plus, that's the nice and easy part. The next part is we have a summation from n is 1 to infinity of 1 over n factorial bracket 1 ma over n plus lambda minus 4 over 2n plus 1 another bracket, 2n plus 1 squared, all over 4, lots of n plus lambda, minus n, and then we have an n minus 1 here. Now, before I dive into all of the little intricacies of this formula, I'm going to first start talking about the history of pi and where pi was initially discovered and the developments of formulas for pi since then and then we'll dive into this very interesting looking formula for pi here. So I guess the first thing that we can say is we know that if we have a circle like so and we have let's call that the center it's a very rough center but anyway and we have the diameter of this circle yep it's a slightly wonky line but anyway it'll go let's say that's the dia diameter of the circle and we have d then we know through mathematics that the circumference so this section we know that the circumference of this circle so circumference is pi d so essentially what you could do is you could take a circle we could measure what the circumference is we could do it with a piece of string and we can also measure what the diameter is and then pi from this is just c divided by d and so that's a very elementary way of computing pi obviously there are a lot of errors that would come with that and so you probably won't expect the most accurate approximation to pi there but give it a go and let me know how you get on in the comments so we know that this is the formal definition of pi we know that the circumference equals pi d we also know that the area is pi r squared and so again we could calculate the area divide by the radius squared and we can get an approximation to pi but the question is can we approximate it a different way and the answer to that is of course yes let's talk about archimedes so what did archimedes do archimedes essentially took a circle and he drew polygons inside the circle and also outside of the circle. Now you'll have to excuse my <laughs> terrible drawings here, but what you may be thinking is, okay, well, let's have a circle, but let's have a much higher sided polygon. Something like this, again, this is, nobody come for me for my, <laughs> my drawing skills. This is why I do maths and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not an artist, but you kind of get the idea. Essentially what we can do here is we can increase the number of sides on the polygon. And so what Archimedes did with this was he was able to deduce an upper and lower bound for pi. We know that pi, as we said, we know that the circumference is pi d. And so what Archimedes was able to do was say, well, if we have a a polygon inside of the circle and a polygon outside of the circle as we increase the number of sides and he increased it to the number 96 so we had a 96 sided polygon 
and from that he was able to juice an upper and lower bound of pi. Now what were these upper and lower bounds? His upper and lower bounds were 223 over 71 and his upper bound was 22 over 7. Now <laughs> some engineers amongst us might recognise this as the typical value that people use when approximating pi. I know some mathematicians may be shocked to hear that. I know I was when I posted this video, my very short video on Instagram, people were saying, no, we just say that pi is three. And I was like, that's not what I was taught because I did maths. But anyway, so yeah, we can approximate pi to whatever values we want. But this here might be the reason, you know, the widespread belief that pi is equal to 22 over seven. Awesome. So that was what Archimedes did. Now, we then move on to uh, another mathematician called Madhava, a very famous Indian mathematician. So Madhava realised that what we can do is we can actually represent pi as an infinite sum. So let's first discuss what an infinite sum is for those of you that don't know. So an infinite sum, typically the notation is this. We have a, a capital sigma, I believe, in the Greek alphabet. And we have n equals 1 to infinity. And let's say we're going to sum n. So what this means is we're basically going to add this value in here for n equals 1 up until n equals infinity. So what this would be, it would be, well, let's first take n equals 1. So we have 1 and we want it all the way up until infinity. So we're going to add 2 because the next number along is n equals 2. Then the next number along is n equals 3 and so on and so forth until we get to infinity. I know mathematically speaking this might look weird to some mathematicians but for the concept just just stick with it. So anyway this is the the typical formula for a series summation. Now like I said it turns out pi can be represented in a very similar way and that's what Madhava discovered. Now let's look at his formula for pi. So Madhava discovered that pi divided by 4 just ignore the divided by 4 here we can kind of multiply up but this was the very famous expression and it's the Pi divided by 4 can be represented as 1 minus a third plus a fifth minus a seventh plus a ninth and so on and so forth, which we can also represent as a summation from n equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the power n divided by 2n plus 1. And so what we have here, like we can go through this equation here and, and check that it checks out. So if we have n equals zero, which is the first term, minus one to the power zero, we know that anything to the power zero is one. And so we'll have one divided by, and then we have two n, which is two times zero, plus one on the bottom. So we have one, that gives us the first term. Then let's take n equals one. When n equals one, we have minus one to the one is minus one because we're just putting it to the power of one. So we have minus one on top, and then we're gonna divide by two multiplied by one. Two plus one is a third, and so we end up with a third here. And you can do the same, you know, try it yourself and see if you can get each of these terms here as well. So that's what pi divided by four is, and this is the very famous Madhava series. You might be looking at these series and thinking, well, how do we know, do, do we always have to take it to infinity? Like, is that, if we were to calculate that, that would take forever because infinity is an incredibly large value. We can't even do that on computer systems. So how do we know where we want to terminate this series? And the answer to that is, well, wherever you want, really. The longer you keep on going with the series, the better the approximation to pi, which is why we have computers nowadays that can compute pi, I think, to something ridiculous like 100 trillion digits, which is, yeah, crazy. So we can... We can truncate this series, which is another term for terminating. And let's take a look at what happens to this series here when we do truncate it at different values. So firstly, we can look at, well, let's do n equals 2. So n is 2, n equals 2 will just give you 1 minus a third. This gives you 2.6. We have n equals 3. This would be 1 minus a third plus a fifth. This gives you 3.42, which is quite close to pi. Then we have n is 4, and this would give you 1 minus a third plus a fifth minus a seventh. 
and that gives you 2.89. What happens is as you increase the n value here, this approximation tends more and more to pi. Pretty cool. Now I find it incredible that pi, which is so beautiful, a very beautiful constant, one of my favorite, one of my favorite numbers, can be represented so elegantly in this way. And I think that is another hidden beauty of mathematics and that's why I love it so much. Sorry to nerd out, but I, yeah, I just think that's beautiful. Now, it turns out there's not just one series, I'm foreshadowing here, but there's not just one series that can represent pi. It turns out another very famous Indian mathematician, which I'm sure all of you are screaming at your TVs or your phones right now, knowing exactly who it is. Yes, it was Ramanujan and he discovered, I think a few different formulas for pi, but in this video, we're gonna look at one because again, it, for me, I look at this formula and think, what an incredible mathematician that he was able to discover this. And you'll know what I mean when I get onto it. Ramanujan's formula was this. So he discovered that one over pi, again, a little bit different, but that was two root two divided by 9,801. And again, we have a summation here. So we have a summation from n equals zero to infinity. We have four n factorial all multiplied by 1,103 plus 26,390n divided by n factorial to the power 4 multiplied by 900, 396 to the power 4n. And this is what Ramanujan discovered. And again, yeah, honestly incredible when you look at that and think, wow. It's not quite, it's, I think it's just as beautiful as this, but you might look at it and think it's not quite as, it's not quite as pretty, but I think it's quite pretty. And Ramanujan was able to discover this formula for pi. As a side note, I have a video on my channel where I dive into all of the maths that we see in the very famous film, The Man Who Knew Infinity, which talks about Ramanujan's story. So if you're interested, then go check that out. I'll link it in the comments. Today's video is covering a very specific area of pure mathematics. Now, despite being an applied mathematician myself, I love pure mathematics. And if you're interested in learning more about pure mathematics or even applied mathematics or statistics or machine learning or anything in the STEM world, then I'd highly recommend checking out brilliant.org. Brilliant have hundreds of different courses covering a range of STEM subjects, including mathematics, applied, pure, statistics, you name it, Brilliant has a course for you. Each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving. This allows you to play with concepts, which is a method that is proven to be six times more effective than simply watching lectures. As someone who is a bit of a tech nerd as well, one of my favorite courses is Brilliant's course on how large language models work. To try out this course, as well as everything else that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org forward slash Ellie or click on the link in the description and you'll also get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thank you so much to Brilliant for allowing me to continue to make really cool videos like these. Now let's get back to the maths. Okay, so the time has come to look at the new formula for pi. So we're just gonna go back up to, to what we had and I'm just gonna copy it here. So again, you might be looking at this and wondering, you might have been pondering the whole video about specific terms in here and what different things mean. So this is my chance to, to address it. Okay, so one of the first things that I think most people commented on, there are two things that people commented on that we're gonna talk about. The first is this here, what this n minus one subscript means. So let's first talk about that and then we'll talk about the elephant in the room that is glaring right at us right now. And that's this extra term lambda here. So firstly, the n minus one subscript, this is what's known as a pop, posh hammer, I believe is how it's pronounced. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and this is a posh hammer symbol. Now what this posh hammer symbol states, it basically means that if you have say X subscript N, it's the same as X times by X plus one multiplied all the way up until X plus N minus one. So it's kind of like a reverse factorial in a way. So this is what this subscript here means. It's basically just means this. Now, the second thing that's staring at us is this lambda value here. Now you might have noticed that in the summation, yes, we're summing from n equals one to infinity, 
and we have ends all over the spot, but there's no term for lambda in here. Do we, do we sum over lambda? What do we do? So lambda here is a constant and I find this fascinating. Sorry to nerd out, but basically you can input any value of lambda you want in here and it will approximate pi to a specific degree. We know that with each formula for pi, because it's a series and the later and later you truncate that series, the better the approximation of pi. Basically different values of lambda will behave differently here. So we could say, let's truncate the series at 10 terms. And so we can do this summation for n equals up to 10 and then choose a specific value of lambda. And that might give like a very specific approximation to pi, but say we change the value of lambda, that might give a better approximation to pi. But then in another sense, if we say let's truncate to 20, that same value of lambda that approximated pi really well might not work there. And so essentially what we have is we have a whole new formula for pi with an additional term lambda, so a constant lambda in here, and we can put, as long as it converges, we can put any value of lambda we want into here, which basically means we have an infinite number of formulas for pi, which, yeah, I, I remember reading about this and I was kicking my little feet and I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is fascinating. I know there's been a lot of people asking about the practical applications for this and what does it mean. Right now, we don't really know, but in maths, it's often that things get discovered and then later down the line, we see them in action and actually used in applications. So at the moment, we don't really know if there's any groundbreaking follow on from this. But either way, I just think as a mathematician myself, this is, yeah, really, really cool. As I mentioned, this can be negative because obviously four plus a positive number is always going to be greater than pi. So yeah, here we have that this can be negative. I'm going to be releasing a follow up coding video on this topic where I'm basically going to code up all of the formulas that we've seen here, see how well they each approximate pi. And with this new, very exciting formula, I'm going to look at how it behaves for different values of lambda and for different values of where we truncate the series. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about coding and the coding side of mathematics, then subscribe so you don't miss out on those videos. Thank you so much for watching and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future videos. I'll see you all in the next one.